G'day and welcome to this parenting session. Courtesy of Learning Links, I'm John Cowan and for about 25 years now I've been keeping a close eye on what parents do and taking note of what seems to work and what things might be changed to make life a little happier and smoother. So I've got a few tips and uh, today the topic is getting cooperation from your kids. Now some people think, oh, are we talking about discipline here? And in their mind, discipline is all about whacking, yelling and making kids feel bad. Nothing could be further from the truth. I've got a different view of discipline from perhaps a lot of people. And I think by the end of the session that should be fairly clear. But it is about promoting behavior that you want and getting on top of behavior you don't want. Now different families have got different approaches to how much compliance they expect from their children. I personally don't think that children should be like performing seals leaping through a hoop the moment you snap your fingers, but it's not unreasonable to expect some reasonable cooperation from your reasonable requests. And it'll certainly make home life, home life a lot less stressful if kids respond and get on with the things they're supposed to do and not give you grief. Can I just say right at the start, I think that there is a big difference between good behavior and misbehavior. And the techniques that you use to get on top of misbehavior do involve sometimes promoting good behavior, but sometimes there is there are reasons behind why a child is misbehaving. I often think that it's very wise for a parent to be a detective to look through the misbehavior and see why is a child not behaving as they should. A great rule of thumb is a child who feels right, acts right, and if your child's behavior is irritating you and on a consistent basis, they're not feeling right. There's something going on there that you need to get on top of. And uh, so I predominantly in this session, though, want to talk about how do you get the good behavior? How do you get the behavior that you're really wanting? And so I'm talking about the things that uh, parents are really, really looking for in their children. And so it's six things here. I think that one of the objectives is kids who can think and solve problems. A lot of what is often thought of as bad behavior is kids trying to get something that they want, but they're doing it in a very inappropriate way. They're feeling hungry and so they snatch something from the fridge. They want a toy from their brother and so they just snatch it off them. But uh, I think that the more we can give our kids the ability to switch on their brains and to think through problems, their behavior will improve. And as we're correcting and guiding our children's behavior, we can actually do things that will help them think. That's coming up. I'm going to unpack each of these things over the next few slides. Kids who want to do the right thing. In an earlier session, I talked about different parenting styles. I talked about jellyfish parents. I talked about sergeant major parents. And, uh, but the sergeant major parent often has kids who are very well behaved. They'll do what they're told but only while the parents are there, only while there's, there's the risk that they might get caught and punished for misbehaving. I think a far better goal is kids who will do the right thing because they want to do the right thing and they'll do it even when you're not there. They agree with your rules, they agree with your standards. And so we'll talk a bit about that. Kids with self-control, because there's lots of children who know what the right thing is and might even want to do the right thing, but their impulse control just overwhelms them and they find themselves getting into mischief. Now, could I just say all children have limited self-control, limited uh, ability to come up and over their impulse control. It's like kids are born with their accelerators functioning, but the steering wheel and brakes aren't working yet. And so good parental discipline, good ga gaining of cooperation is about assisting children to get self-control. We want kids who also have got character, kids who are aware of some of the, the morals and values that you hold. Uh, and uh, I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about how you can help your children take those on board. Kids who care. Why do we want them to behave well? Because we want them to look after their siblings and their mates and you and to fit in well and make friends and uh, be, be, be valuable members of society, kids who care. And 
kids with boundaries, and by that I mean kids who know how to function in different situations. You might be quite happy with your kids bouncing all over your furniture, but they need to know that when they visit grandma in a fancy rest home, uh, they don't want them do. They don't want children ducking and diving all over the place, all over the furniture there. And so we'll talk a little bit about how to give them boundaries so that they know how to be comfortable in different situations. But uh, the first one I've got here is kids who think, and could I just say straight off, you are wiser than your kids. It's probably a result of you being older. That's usually a bit of a biological requirement. You have to be a little bit older than your kids. And uh, that means that you know more, you can solve problems better. You probably have a good solution to every one of the, of the problems that your children has. And they'll be great solutions. But you know what? It is far better when your kids have got a problem, a bit of a dilemma, to throw it back to them and to sometimes even act a little dumb and to get them get them thinking about what they could do to sort out their problem. Oh, gee, you and your brother have been having a rough time. What's something that you could do to get on better with him? Oh, you had trouble with Grandma this afternoon? She didn't sound like she was very happy of how, how, you, get, how you were behaving today. What's something that you might be able to do differently next time you go to Grandma's place? You get them to solve their own problems and to think things through, and it switches their brain on. Your kids have got brilliant brains. Why? Because they got those brains from you. But the trick for parents is to get them to switch on their brains. And our little lectures and, uh, and sermons that we give them, they don't switch brains on at all. They tend to switch brains off. But good questions can switch a brain on. Why do you think we should do this? What would be a good, a good way of being able to know that we're all going to be safe if we do that? Putting the questions back to them, and uh, that can really, really help create some bright, clever kids. You'll be amazed at how good they are at thinking, and they'll enjoy that you respect the idea that they've got an opinion on things. So ask lots and lots of questions. The second thing that I had on that list, on that slide, was kids who want to do the right thing. And could I just say that I think that this is one of the cardinal rules of happy families. You have to set rules, you have to set boundaries, you have to set limits just for their safety and for everyone to be able to get on with each other. But this should this is worth getting tattooed somewhere. Rules about relationships lead to rebellion. Rules about relationships lead to rebellion. There's some parents who have got brilliant rules. They've got limits that have been well thought out. They're absolutely appropriate for those children. They're age appropriate, sensible, logical rules and their kids just don't seem to get it. Why? Because the kids don't really like them all that much at the moment. If kids don't really relate to you and respect you and love you, it's going to be very, very hard for them to actually believe that your rules are, are right. They might follow those rules because they're scared of some consequence, but when they really want to please you, when they admire you, when they want to take on board what's in your heart, then you'll find that your rules will almost automatically be taken up by them. I think that perhaps one of the most striking examples of this is if any of you have the experience of becoming a step parent. And you may have very successfully raised kids in another home and you come into this new context and you think, I'll just do what worked with the other kids and it's a failure. And yet there's nothing wrong with the rules, nothing wrong with what you're actually doing. It's just that it takes years for the relationship to build up to the point where those kids will actually accept good, uh, accept discipline from a step parent. And so rules about relationship lead to rebellion. If you're a step parent, can I just say perhaps your major role should be stepping in to support the biological parent while you work on building your relationship. And then as the years go by, you'll be able to step in more and more to be able to do some discipline. So some parents have got kids that are causing a lot of problems. I used to work with uh, people that, uh, with parent coaches, family coaches, and they would have lots and lots of people with problems come into them. And sometimes those parents had set consequences after consequences. The behavior was appalling, and so they kept on basically punishing the kids. They'd take away their toys, take away their technology, take away their free time, their pocket money, their access to the internet. Everything was gone from their bedroom except the light bulb, and that's going next week if they don't buck their ideas up. But the thing is, I think that sometimes 
what's needed there is a reset of the relationship. Things have been so bad for so long, but rules about relationship leads to rebellion. And so they perhaps need to go, oh, let's give it a rest. Let's take that kid camping. Let's go and kick a soccer ball around. Let's make sure that we have breakfast down at McDonald's a couple of times this month and reset the relationship so that the rules can get some traction. And so could I just say that might be the parenting technique, which if you take it on board, could revolutionize your parenting. Realizing that it's not out of the grumpiness and, that you have or the firmness or sternness or even how good your, your rules are, it's the relationship you form with your kids that really makes the difference. Kids with self-control. This is one of the major reasons we bother with discipline. It's one of the major reasons we bother teaching our kids. I know that um, we seem to go blue in the face, getting them to pick up after themselves and to load the dishwasher and to make their beds or do whatever else. And we're thinking, why? Why am I bothering to do this? I should just throw them out of the house and they can play outside and I can get on with cleaning up. It'll take less time and less energy and I'll do it better anyway. But chores and, and discipline and getting them to follow the rules and customs of your house. Uh, why are you doing this? Because it builds self-discipline. Your external discipline will help them to switch on that ability to withstand their impulse control so that they don't just race off in all directions following whatever whim and appetite comes into their head. They're actually thinking about what do I do now? Deferred gratification is meant to be the major life skill that determines success in life. That ability to hold out for some better reward than the immediate reward. And so self-discipline is one of the most important, perhaps the most important life skill you can teach your children. How do you teach it? By getting them to comply with those little rules that you have in your house. You might have rules like take your shoes off at the door, or that you don't bring technology to the table, or that you let guests go first at the table. All these little manners and rules and things. And some people might think, what's the reason for that? And sometimes the reasons might be obscure, but all those little rules and things are teaching your kids that I can bring myself under my own control. And uh, that's one of them. That's the real goal of your external discipline for them to build some internal discipline. Kids with character. In uh, a crazy world that we live in, we really do need kids which have got good values and morals, who know that they belong to something, who are contributors to their family, to their school, to their society. Now, it used to be something that got a lot of emphasis in parenting. There would be a lot of, of little um, mottos and wall charts and things, but can I just urge you not to neglect it entirely. Just talk a little bit about the things that are important to you. It might be that you care for the planet, care for animals, care for each other, the love that you have for each other, and teaching them to, uh, to value their, their, their family and uh, and to think a bit about the about some of the bigger things there might be spiritual values there might be cultural values that are important to you teach them but could i just say teaching is important but the most important thing that will determine whether your kids follow those rules or not is your own example i hate guilting parents out and and everything like this but quite honestly um the most important thing in parenting is not doing the right stuff, it's being the right stuff. It's perhaps one of the most wonderful things about being a parent is that it inspires us to become better people for the sake of our children. And so could I just say, take for instance honesty. The absolutely scrupulous honesty that you have will impact your children immensely. If they know that you never take things that aren't yours, if they know that um, you're queuing up to get into the zoo or something, and uh, you could tell your kids to fib about their age and you'll save a heap of money getting them in at half price. But that, uh, that little saving that you'll make it in the queue there is going to have a huge repercussions on their values. So we need to be scrupulously honest, scrupulously respectful, but respect that they hear us talking about our own parents when we come off the phone to them, that's going to have a huge bearing on their general respect as well. So values and morals should be taught, yes, but they're mainly caught. And kids 
are disciplined and controlled and given co and and we try to gain cooperation from them to encourage them to care. And can I just say uh, two ways you can do this. One is the, one is for them to understand that your rules are all about your protection and your love. I said before that rules without relationship lead to rebellion, but another great rule is for parents is rules without reasons lead to rebellion. And so if you should be able to prefix all of the rules that you set for your kids with the little phrase, because I love you. Hey, because I love you, I don't want you getting too um, badly hurt if you fall out of a tree. So yes, you can climb the tree, but you're not allowed to go higher than that branch up there. No higher than that. Hey, because I love you and I don't want you to get hurt, I don't want you to play with petrol and matches in the middle of a lounge. Because I love you, and because I love your brother as well, I don't want you playing that roughly, okay? If you're going to have a rough and tumble, please, out on the trampoline. And so um, if, when kids know that your rules are not just because you're uptight and a sergeant major, but they actually have some reason behind them. So this means that sometimes kids may challenge the rule. Why? Why do I have to do that? And then you can say your reason, or if you can't think of a reason, you can actually scratch your head and go, I'm sure I had a reason, but I can't think of what it, what, what it is now. Just do it now, but uh, let's have a think about it. And if I can't think of a good reason by tomorrow, let's have a meeting and let's see if we can change the rule. By the way, kids love that. The fact that you're reasonable, that you're prepared to think about the reasons behind rules, especially as kids get older and can handle more responsibility and risk, and you're prepared to negotiate. They love that, but they also love even more that your rules are to keep them safe and they're an expression of your love. And in our family, we is a great way to prefix your rules. It means that uh, you, because there is something even bigger than mum or bigger than dad, it's the family. In our family, we use our hands for helping, not hurting. In our family, we always make sure that we're all sitting together before we start eating. In our family, we treat guests as special. And so it's a great way of teaching your morals and values as well. But it also gives an idea that family is something very special. And family is a template of caring that can extend later on to uh, society and even the world. Kids who learn how to care for their brothers and sisters and parents, I'm sure, are going to be caring people right through their lives. Kids with boundaries. Now, this is one of the things that uh, people sometimes, you know, perhaps think, oh, my kids will chafe and feel um, feel res too restricted if I set boundaries around them. Do you know what? Research has shown that kids actually feel more secure with some boundaries in their life. And uh, I remember a, a, a quite a famous story about a, a a child care centre that had a fence and kids would play right up to the fence. The fence was taken down uh, because um, I think they're extending the property or something like that. Kids didn't go anywhere near where the fence had formerly been. They felt quite safe going up to the, you know, because the fence was there. It gave them a sense of security. I drive over the Auckland Harbour Bridge quite often. I can even drive on the outside line. I don't feel too freaked about that. And yet I'm... I wonder how confident I would feel about driving over that bridge if that little low boundary fence wasn't there on the edge. Now, I've never hit that fence. I don't drive over the bridge with my front of my car scraping in a shower of sparks along the, the, the guard uh, the guardrail of the fence. But if that fence wasn't there, I don't know how confident I'd feel about driving over that bridge. Kids do give kids a sense, sorry, limits do give kids a sense of security, knowing that there is a big person who's looking out for them. One of the things that's interesting about kids is that they readily accept different rules in different places, different sets of boundaries. When they go to kindy, then they go to a play centre, when they go off to school, they know that there are rules there. And uh, so this is one of the things that you can say, hey, in our family, we can sit in the lounge and eat off their plates on the carpet while we're watching telly. But remember, at grandma's, they've got a different set of rules there. We always sit at the table. Kids can handle that. And it's one of the things about helping them to be able to fit in socially, to understand that different people will have different rules. 
You might be quite happy with your kids calling you by your first name, for instance. In other families, they'd find that quite rude. And uh, so you just say, hey, remember when you go around to the Tonkins place, they like to call you, you, they like children to call them Mr. Tonkin and Mrs. Tonkin. Manners. Manners sometimes sound so old fashioned, and yet they're a wonderful way of showing love and be- love and respect to people. And it's it's the type of boundaries like that that make your kids, when they know them, make your kids so popular with people. You'll have kids that get invited back. It's also a key to their safety when kids say, when you say, no, you mustn't ever go out onto the out into the drive when dad's backing uh, backing the car out. When you say, no, you must stay away from the lawnmower when the when we're mowing. You know, little rules like that. They might think it's fun to race backwards and forwards around these things, but in actual fact, it's a safety issue. And so, teaching kids to follow boundaries and rules is uh, the foundation of their safety. It's the foundation of good relationships when kids know how to treat each other uh, each other well and to uh, be safe with them. And could I just say one of the a cool way to keep, teach kids the required things, the things that you're wanting them to do is to teach them what to do rather than what not to do. Rather than saying, you know, don't stand on the chairs at the table, you can say seats are for sitting on. Put your bottom on the seat. So you're telling them what to do. And uh, you can apply that quite a, uh, quite a lot of the time, giving them clear instructions that they can load into their head and eat. Now, we're talking about the things that we're wanting to see. What if they're stepping outside the line? What if they're breaking the rules? And I want to talk a little bit about loving discipline. Some people think, should those rules ever be together? Should those words actually go together, loving and discipline? Yes, I don't. I think that's the only type of discipline we should do. Um, I think if we're doing discipline without love in our hearts, if we're doing discipline, for instance, with anger in our hearts, it's probably not discipline at all. It's probably just revenge. They've made us feel upset. They've made us feel um, angry. And so we're going to make them feel upset. And so that's not what loving discipline's about. Discipline, in my mind, is thinking into the future and thinking, how can I help my children do better in the, uh, in the next time they hit a situation like this? It's a coaching approach, thinking about uh, not like a forensic investigator or a detective, thinking, let's find out what they did wrong and make sure they feel really bad about it. No, you're thinking about, hmm, how can we help my, ch- my child to behave better next time? And so... Discipline is something that you don't do to your child because you're angry. You do it for them because you love them. So, just a word about anger. I wish anger worked as a parenting tool because I'm really very good at it. I'm very naturally gifted at at anger, but it never seems to give the results that I I wanted as as a parent, especially when my kids were little. You know, if, uh, very, very seldom after giving my kids a really big yelling at, did they ever come back to me afterwards and say, oh, well, thank you very much for that telling off, Dad. That was just what we needed to see the light and get back on track. No, it would just stink up the atmosphere. And often it muddles their thinking. One of the goals, of, I said, of, of this discipline thing is to help them to think to help them work out a better way of behaving, to help solve problems. But if they're fuming because they've just been told off or they're feeling ashamed or uh, or angry, they can't do that thinking. It switches off those bits of the brain that you want to think. It can also damage your relationship, especially if they feel that there's injustice or you have been too harsh. And uh, what was the basis of good discipline? Rules without relationship leads to rebellion and so you're destroying the ability for your discipline to actually work so anger doesn't really work but it sometimes appears to work because it gets kids to rip quickly come back into line but um, i tend to think it's only that superficial uh, compliance where they are doing something to avoid getting punished and that doesn't lead to kids doing the right thing when you're not around remember we want kids who want to do the right thing so I am very grateful for something I learned when I was a hospital scientist many years ago. I was running down a corridor, around a corner, and I collided with a nurse. Boom! Sent her sprawling backwards. 
And uh, she got up, and I thought she was going to punch me, because they can be pretty tough, some of those nurses. But instead, she just waggled her finger in my face and said, only run for fire and hemorrhages. And I thought, what wise advice. What profound wisdom. I'm going to try and apply that to every aspect of my life. Only run for fire and hemorrhages. There'll be times in your parenting when you have to act straight away. When you see your, ch your toddler up on the roof of the carport, when you see your children about to ignite something, when you see uh, them doing something dangerous, when they're fighting, yes, you act straight away. But there's a lot of times, a lot of instances, where you don't need to act straight away. You need to act, but not immediately. I can remember when my kids were little, or when they were at school, actually, I'd come home and uh, they would be home before me and I'd open the door. Well, actually, I couldn't open the door because their school bags had been dropped in the passage behind the door. I'd go into the kitchen and the countertop would be covered in bread bags and mess and spilt juice and the, the results of their snack making. And I'd go into the lounge and the curtains would all be drawn and they'd be watching stupid music videos or something with their shoes up on the sofa. Oh, I'd be boiling by the stage and I'm thinking... I need to act, but do I have to act straight away? Is there any fire? Is there any blood? Only run for fire and hemorrhages, so g'day kids, I'm just going to have a bit of a walk and then I'm going to come back and talk to you. That pause helped me to be a much more reasonable parent. It helped me to think through what I was going to do and say and be more creative. And so could I really urge you to take that on board. If you're a parent that finds yourself getting a little bit hot under the collar and grumpy at times, try and pause. Yes, there's times when you need to act instantly, but if you can avoid uh, acting straight away, you might find that you act more creatively and in a more loving way. So, pause can be a fantastic parenting tool. So, another thing, as well as the pausing, see the behavior see through their behavior to the child. This is what I was talking about before, to actually see behavior as being a symptom. What, uh, a child that's feeling right tends to act right, but if your child's consistently not acting right, are they feeling loved? Are they feeling they're getting enough of your time? Are they being bullied? Is there some issue that you need to get on top of? Is there some emotional problem? And so sometimes you do need to do a bit of detective work, which might not excuse the behavior, but it might explain it. I was talking to a friend, the other week and talking about how their daughter had got really lippy and rude and was uh, behaving really, really unpleasantly. Uh, but her grandmother had died a fortnight before. Now, at the time, it seemed like the, 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 the daughter had got over the loss almost straight away. They, the children sometimes see them almost flippant in the way that they get over a loss like that. But that's because they don't know how to express it or process it. And so often that behavior will come back in, uh, as misbehavior a bit later on. Another thing to do is to separate the child from the behavior. And what I mean by that is the child is always acceptable, but the behavior isn't. And so, and, and, and so you're careful to make sure that when you're addressing their misbehavior, you're, you're actually directing it straight at the behavior, not at the kid's heart. So instead of saying, you're a liar, you can say, hey, that's not true. And in our family, we tell the truth. OK, instead of saying you're a thief, you can say, hey, that's that's stealing. That's taking things that don't belong to you. And you're a better kid than that. So you can actually say to your children that you actually believe that they're better than their behavior, that there's ways of actually telling kids off that actually inspires them. Even while you're setting penalties, even while you're scolding them, you can be letting them know that you're disappointed, not because you think they're bad, but because you know that they're good. And that can make a profound difference. So you're separating out the child from the behavior. It means that you can still love the child. It means that you can still, rather than being offended by their behavior, you see it as being a problem that the two of you are going to work on together. You're working for the child in helping them get on top of that behavior, not seeing the child and the behavior as one thing. Just to uh, finish off on just a couple of techniques. I haven't mentioned a lot of techniques in the session because you already know so many. You've got lots of techniques, but now that you've got also some um, understanding of what you're trying to do, these will work a little bit better. Distraction is wonderful, especially if you see your children st starting to bubble up like a volcano that's about to blow. 
and then it is so good to actually head it off at the pass and get their mind onto something else. You know, they're starting to get a bit scratchy with each other, brother and sister fighting with each other, and you can say, hey, I'd like you to uh, duck down over there, because I think there's some toys underneath the sofa that's no one, that no one's played with for a long time. You duck under there and see what you can find. If you're at the supermarket, you can send them off to, to oh, hey, we need some beans. Can you duck down there and find some beans? Distracting them, uh, calling them over to help you, giving them a little task to do, it can be great at just getting them off that sour, grumpy track that they might be on. Consequences can work quite well, but sometimes parents don't do it as well as they could because they're inconsistent. They're sometimes thinking in terms of revenge rather than actually trying to change behavior. But yes, there are a lot of things that you control in their world. Their access to technology, their pocket money, their uh, ability to play with things, uh, toys that they have, uh, the ability to go outside. You can use some of those things as, um, as consequences to behavior that doesn't work. But what really, really works well is if the consequences are logical, if they make sense. If, uh, if you have, say, things like, hey, I asked you to pick up all these toys. Sadly, these toys are going to go in a box now and you won't be able to play with them until the day after tomorrow. OK, and so you're linking something that you're setting to what they're doing. Consequences don't work very well with some kids, but see how it works. The thing is, you're the expert on your child. You need to try different techniques and find out what works. Sometimes choices gets great cooperation from children that and so things like um, do you want to go to bed riding on my back or walking on my feet the child had been you know digging a trench getting ready to fight a pitch battle about not going to bed at all but now there's a choice and they have to go into a thinking mode do i want to go to bed on dad's back do i want to go walking on his feet and suddenly it's a choice uh do you want to have juice or do you want to have um water okay you've given them two choices they had been lining up to grab some soft drink or something, but no, you've given them some choices. You've set the boundaries that they've got a choice within them. And yes, there can occasionally be a place for sternness, your grim face. But could I just, and your, in your loud voice, but could I just say, this will become completely useless if you use it all the time. The trouble with using a stern face and a grim voice and uh, or grim face and stern voice is that uh, is that you find that you have to use it more and more to, for it to have any effect and you end up grumping at them even to get them to do things that they want to do I said come here and have some ice cream could I just say it can be incredibly effective but save it for the most extreme and, and, and times when you really need automatic compliance and to stop them doing something that might be dangerous or harmful, really, really annoying. And so it should be, it, then it can be very, very powerful. If they see it seldom, it can be very, very effective. Use it all the time and that'll just be the way they'll remember you when you're dead. Oh, mum, yeah, she didn't smile very much, did she? So look, that's just a few techniques and tips and a few ideas about getting cooperation. There's so much more on this topic uh, I could we could talk a lot more about techniques. We could talk a lot more about understanding the psychology of changing children's behavior. But this has just been a short little session. I hope there'll be something in here that's of use to you. By the way, as always, it's parenting can be hard work. And sometimes our own mental health can be a little bit uh, frayed in the process. Please see your doctor, ring one of the helplines. You can see it on the screen there. ParentingPlace.nz, lots and lots of good parenting resources there. Uh, there's good stuff all over the internet, but I know the Parenting Place. I worked for them for a long time. They've got good resources. Your doctor, always a good place to sort out issues. Uh, if they don't know how to help you, they'll know someone who can. And also the helpline, the Parenting Helpline, uh, 0800 568 856. Don't get desperate. Don't feel stuck. There's always someone who's there willing to help. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. I look forward to being back with you again with some more parenting advice in the future. Cheers.